All right, well, welcome to class. Uh, today we're gonna to be talking about um, beauty. Now I know on the syllabus, we are set to talk about political philosophy, but just because of uh, recording, lectures, scheduling, we're gonna talk about beauty this week, and next week we'll talk about political philosophy, and then the week after that will be our study guide, our final study guide overview. So today, we're gonna to be talking about beauty, and you'll need to watch this lecture. And then at the end of this lecture, at the end of the lecture, usually you have a quiz at the beginning, at the end of this lecture, I'm actually gonna give you a quiz um, that you will just need to email me just like you did with the 21 Chump Street um, uh, quiz for the section on moral philosophy. So glad you're watching the video. I really hope that you're doing well. Um, I'm praying for you guys during this difficult time. Um, if you have any questions, you can always email me, adamgroza at gs.edu. Um, but I hope that you're doing well. I um, hope that you're staying safe. hope that your families are doing well. And um, so, yeah, today we're going to be talking about um, beauty, uh, kind of how, in a philosophical sense, do we think about beauty. And to start off, though, I want to recap a little bit about some of your feedback for 21 Jump Street. I hope that you enjoyed 21 Chump Street, not Jump Street, Chump Street. Um, I hope that you enjoyed that. I, th I just think that's a great little musical and it really highlights the different ways that we can think about uh, moral philosophy, moral dilemmas. You know, just kind of how, you know, how to, how to tell what's the right thing to do in a circumstance. And so um, in talking about 21 Jump, St Jump Street, um, I want to raise, uh, I want to address sort of some of the f top five common f uh, comments that I got in the quizzes, sort of uh, addressing the feedback you gave me about how you're processing the morality of the Justin versus Naomi. So those are the two teams. You got some of you sided with Justin and you said Justin should not have been arrested. Some of you sided with Naomi and said Naomi was she was just doing her job. And the way it broke down was like this, okay? So you can kind of see this. The red here is Team Justin. So the vast majority of you sided with Justin and thought it was wrong for Justin to be arrested. And a very small percentage, maybe about eight of you, were on Team Naomi. And uh, so a much smaller percentage if we were in class, we could get together and really have a pretty lively discussion about who's right and who's wrong. But if you're on Team Naomi, you are in the minority. If you are on Team Justin, you are in the majority. But what's interesting to me is some of the reasoning many of you gave me for uh, telling me why you were on Team Justin versus Team Naomi. So let's talk about a few of those things. Um, uh, and remember, in philosophy, we analyze definitions and we apply logic and reasoning to just sort of any topic. And in this sense, and in this regard, it's a topic of morality. Um, so one of the things some of you said was that Justin is only a kid. So, you know, many of you, not, not just one or two, many of you said, uh, look, Justin was just a kid. And I might have responded to you by saying, well, what do you mean he was only a kid? I mean, he's 18. And if you're going to say, well, yeah, he's 18, but really you're not sort of, you know, your brain is still developing to your, you know, in your 20s. But now you have to think about this. Um, if you want to say Justin shouldn't be held responsible for what he did when he was 18, then do you also believe that people shouldn't have adult responsibilities till they're in their mid-20s? Because if you're going to say we should have the, the, the privileges of adulthood, don't you also have to say we have the responsibilities of adulthood? Because Justin was 18. He was charged as an adult because legally he was an adult. So when you turn 18, you know, you can join the military, you can vote, um, you can do all kinds of adult things because, you, because you're an adult. Um, and, and if you're going to say, well, he was legally an adult, but sort of like biologically he was still a kid then I'm interested to know, are you consistent with that? And do you believe that people should have to be like 23, 24, 25, 26, whatever it is, 
to get married or to uh, join the military or to vote for president. I mean, voting for president, that's a pretty adult thing. Um, but probably most of you would say, no, we should be able to vote at 18. But so there's a little bit of a consistency issue that you might need to just think through, okay? The second thing, some of you said Justin wasn't a drug dealer. And this is kind of an interesting claim because technically, remember one of the aspects of moral reasoning is gathering the facts. And technically, Justin is a drug dealer because he dealt drugs, right? He gave someone drugs in exchange for money. Now, some of you said, well, Naomi made him do it. Well, what do you mean she made him do it? We believe in free will, right? I mean, are you saying Justin couldn't have said no? I mean, if I mean, if I was 18 and I'm in high school and some pretty girl said, hey, Adam, you know, get me drugs. Say, hey, you know, I'm not gonna get you drugs. And if I did get her drugs and I said, here's the drugs, she said, well, give me money. So I'm not taking your money. I mean, Justin could have, A, not gotten the drugs, or B, not taking money for the drugs. He didn't have to take the money. So there's that great song, you know, take the money, take the money. Uh, I mean, it's a great musical and a lot of really interesting questions are raised, but you know, he wasn't forced. I mean, she didn't put a gun to his head. And look, a lot of crimes are committed based upon someone's desire to be welcomed to a relevant peer group. And you know, it's not really, like love is not a defense. You know, you can't say, well, hey, your honor, I did it, but look, I really wanted to be in with this person or this group. I mean, that's, it's not gonna get you out of a jam. Uh, it's not gonna get you out of handcuffs. It's not gonna get you out of jail. So, you know, some of you said Justin was a good guy. Justin was a good guy. And this, look, this resonates with me because I've watched this, I've watched this musical many times. We love it in my family. And also I've listened to like the, ra the actual radio show upon which the musical is based. And I, Justin seems like a really nice guy, but what do you mean by good guy? I mean, if he's a good guy, I mean, do you think, do you think good guys sell drugs? Um, do you think that like it's, it's a quality of goodness to sell drugs? Um, or do you think that one of the sort of like basic definitions of a good guy is a good guy doesn't do things that harm other people? Well, putting drugs into the hands of other people harms people, it harms families, it harms, it's harmful. So if you want to think of yourself as a good person, probably baseline definition is you're not doing things that you know harm other people. And selling drugs harms other people. And even if you say, yeah, but he only sold drugs this once. Well, I mean, how many times do you have to sell drugs to be a drug dealer? Like if I decided I'm not a drug dealer, I'm just going to do this once, but I happen to get caught that one time, I'm probably going to go to jail for being a drug dealer because technically I am. Um, and number five, some of you said Naomi abused her position, which um, I'm, I'm sort of sensitive to this. I think, you know, she definitely might have crossed whatever the line is between uh, like wise police work and coercion or entrapment. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, um, I, I'm not a criminal justice professor, but I do know that Naomi posed as a high school student and he thought she was a high school student. So, I mean, really we have a high school student interacting with another high school student. So I don't think like authority plays into this because her authority was unknown to Justin. The only authority she had was a relational authority and the only relational authority anyone has over you is the relational authority that you give them. So like if you have a friend that's like coercing you into buying them cigarettes, you know, they're your friend. You don't have to do that. You can say, no, I'm not doing this. I mean, it's totally within your relational capacity to say no, which I think is one of the saddest things about the 21 Chump Street story is that Justin just at every point could have said no. Um, just like you at any point can say no to any other individual. Um, I mean, especially when we're talking about relational, peer-to-peer -peer relational coercion. You know, like tonight a friend could say to you, let's go steal and you could say no i'm not doing that and it might be hard and it might cost you friend friends but um you know that that's life so i i don't know i don't know that i buy this just because her position and authority again was just unknown to justin but i'm glad that you enjoyed it i got a lot of good feedback um hope it was enjoyable and uh yeah so that was just kind of a follow-up discussion on 21 chump street 
So now let's get into aesthetics, which is the philosophical study of art and beauty. So when we think about the main pillars of the good life, goodness, truth, and beauty, goodness, metaphysics, uh, I'm sorry, um, truth, metaphysics, um, goodness, morality, and beauty corresponds to aesthetics. So in philosophy, we talk about aesthetics, which is sort of the analytical, reasoned, logical pursuit of definitions that relate to uh, concepts of beauty. So that's what we're going to be talking about in this, uh, in this lecture. So here's the big idea that I really want you to grasp. Uh, goodness, truth, and beauty come from Christ and are found in Christ. That's the claim that I hope to support really kind of the rest of uh, the lecture. These things make sense. Beauty makes sense in the context of God revealed in Christ. And beauty, apart from God revealed in Christ, I think is really a hopelessly vague, opaque, and slippery definition. Um, and I think the further away from theology aesthetics gets, the less sense that it makes. And I hope to show you maybe an example of that um, in, this, in this lecture. So, um, so this is what I want you to really know, that God's character is the source of beauty. Humans are made in God's image. Human creativity, and when we talk about art, we're talking about sort of the artifacts of human creativity. Human creativity is one evidence of God's image in us. So human creativity, the pursuit of beauty, is actually, I think, kind of an argument for God's existence. I mean, why do we do this? We don't, we don't make beauty to survive. We make beauty to thrive. Evolution gets us survival, but it doesn't get us human flourishing. It doesn't get us human thriving. So creativity, art, is the pursuit of beauty. And the aim of art is beauty, and the aim of beauty is to draw our affections to God, who is the source of beauty. So the foundation of beauty is God's character. Our connection with that is God's image within us. The whole human pursuit of art is evidence of God's image within us. Um, and the aim of art is beauty. And the aim of beauty is to draw our affections to God. So hopefully you see kind of like this, kind of like the circle of purpose, that like God's character leads to our creativity, our creativity leads to beauty. Beauty draws our attention to that which is higher, that which is praiseworthy, that which is like transcendent, and those things in turn draw our att attention and our affections back to God. So look, if you care about beauty, you should care about God. Now here's the problem. Sin blinds us to beauty. Uh, sin blinds us to beauty. Sin uh, affects our thinking, and as our thinking is affected, our ability to sort of apprehend and comprehend beauty is diminished. And, you know, look, I bet this is true in your own life. Like, I'll bet you when you are walking in um, habits and patterns that are sinful, they're not honoring to God, you know it. You know, even if you're kind of far from God, you know if you're doing things that are wrong. Um, I'll bet you that there's sort of a dulling of your senses. I'll bet you that, you know, like when you sin um, and then you go outside and there's a beautiful sunset, I'll bet you appreciate that sunset less than when you are sort of living in ways that you know honor God, reflect God's character. So um, sin blinds us to beauty. Um, immorality, lies, idolatry affects every aspect of life including our ability to perceive and appreciate beauty. So if you want to appreciate beauty, like if you care about beauty, you should care about God. You should care about knowing God in Christ. You should care about like living a life that's honoring to God because to the extent that you live a life that's honoring to God, you will understand, apprehend, appreciate, and reflect beauty. Like if you want the world to be beautiful, you need to pursue holiness. Holiness and beauty are like coterminous. They go together. They thrive together or they die together. So a world where people are pursuing holiness is a world where there is going to be beauty. And a world where people are indulging in sin is an ugly, uh, ugly world where we're blind to sin. We are callous to uh, that which is beautiful. So sin blinds us to beauty. 
Um, Romans 1, 18 through 32 um, talks about how the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And one of the truths that we in our sin suppress is the truth of beauty, the relationship between beauty and God. And when we are indulging in sin, we want to separate beauty from God because we want to separate everything from God. You know, this is the, this is the predicament of, of humans in our rebellion against God is we want, God, we want life apart from God. And, you know, when Jesus says, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life, um, you know, Jesus is saying, you know, you can't sort of separate life from me. You know, Jesus, you know, is, is life. God is life. If you want to have life and really know what it's about and really experience it, um, then you need to be connected to God through faith in Christ. If you do, you're going to be somebody who really gets beauty and pursues beauty. And if you don't, then you're going to be callous to beauty. And, and you might even find yourself gravitating towards, gravitating towards things that are ugly. And this is a really dangerous thing. Let me just say, if you, you, know, if you find yourself in life liking things that are ugly, liking things that are opposed to life, like liking death and liking destruction. You know, that's a sign almost certainly that you've you've sort of distanced yourself from God. Because if 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 you're drawing near to God, you're going to love life and love truth and love beauty. And um, so beauty is is a real, uh, like, reliable indicator of kind of where we're at with God, just for the reasons that I've laid out. Um, and, and Romans talks about the fact that um, we exchange um, the truth of God for lies. Um, uh, you know, that we, we exchange what is true for what is, what is, uh, what is false. And, um, and yeah, this is true with, with art, you know. Like art is supposed to be about beauty, but when we walk away from God, we gravitate towards art that celebrates like what is debased. So if you are, um, you know, if you're walking away from God and you're drawn towards forms of beauty that are debased and crass and foul, you know, um, you know that's a, a symptom of a problem. And the problem stems, you know, from your relationship to God. And when you flee to God in Christ and when you, like, embrace God and when you're, like, really walking with God, um, you know, those, those debased forms of art are going to be less and less attractive to you. Um, uh, just because your tastes are shaped by God. So, like, you, you have a taste for what is good. You have a taste for what is pure. Um, you know, kind of an analogy in our um, aesthetic senses, you could kind of make an analogy towards, like, our, our physical senses. Like, if you, uh, I, I don't know if you've ever gone through a period where, like, eat healthy, and, like, you, you know, you're eating healthy, you're staying away from, like, like, ice cream and like processed sugars and then like you eat like an apple and the apple tastes so good tastes so sweet because your taste buds have been trained like by healthy things whereas if you are eating like junk food and a a ton of sweets an apple actually doesn't taste that sweet It's, it's really not that good because like because you're used to like the artificial sweetness of like processed foods so yeah, beauty is really important in terms of knowing where we come from and knowing where we're at and knowing how to live. I mean, it's an indicator. It's a compass that helps us know if we're pointed in the right direction. Okay? And the Bible talks a lot about this. So if sin separates us from God, hopefully you can see this. I'll say this. If sin separates us from God and if God is the source of beauty, then sin separates us from beauty. On the other hand, if we want to pursue beauty, we must pursue God. So that's like a big takeaway, this connection between God and beauty, our pursuit of God, our pursuit of beauty, our pursuit of holiness, and our capacity to understand and appreciate that which is life-giving, that which is praiseworthy, that which is beautiful. Okay, so Christianity is a religion of beauty. God, um, God's beauty is evident in himself, in his character, um, God's beauty is evident in his word, in his world, in creation, and, and in his virtues. And so uh, where, where Christianity has thrived, beauty 
and art has thrived. So like, you know, if you go to Europe and you see like these amazing buildings and art, um, usually you're appreciating something that was born out of a time when Christianity was thriving because Christianity uh, um, encourages beauty and the pursuit of beauty and um, art and paintings and music. And um, so um, like if you've been convinced by anybody that like Christianity and art are opposed, that's not true if we're talking about art as that which is beautiful and celebrates what is life-giving. Um, now Christianity is opposed to forms of art that are not life-giving. Like for instance, you know, there are some people that want to say pornography is art. And as a Christian, I would say pornography is exploitation. Pornography celebrates that which is a lie, not that which is true. So the tragedy of pornography and pornographic, uh, the, 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 the addiction of pornography in our country uh, is really the tragedy of people that have, again, like Roman says, exchanged the truth for a lie. They've exchanged something uh, that is beautiful for something that is ugly and called that which is ugly beautiful in the same way that people called an idol God when really uh, their idol was dead, you know, pornography and, and you know, ugly forms of, uh, you know, sort of synthetic art are, are dead. They're not life-giving. And, you know, and, and this is why where you have this kind of addiction, you have, you have the opposite of life. You have, you know, you have broken homes, you have broken relationships, you have, you know, shallow, hollow human beings that really are not appreciating life. They're not thriving because they've exchanged the truth for a lie what is beautiful for what is ugly, and they've called that which is ugly, uh, that which is bad, good. And that's the whole tragedy of Romans 1, uh, as, we, as we've seen. So, the Christian model of aesthetic virtue corresponds to virtues. Remember that God's beauty is evident and, and, and obvious through these virtues. You know, virtues, uh, moral virtues, um, and also theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. So Christian model of aesthetic virtues, as Christians, we should want art that is technically excellent, that is true, that is original, that has integrity, and has intentionality. So, um, so as Christians, you know, sometimes we get a bad rap for kind of our art is derivative, and, and that can be true. But as Christians, we should be promoting art and the pursuit of beauty uh, that is technically excellent and truth-telling and original and, and, and high moral integrity. So like, like here's, here's a test, right? Like when you listen to a song, does it make you want to be a good person? Or does it kind of give you a soundtrack to sin? You know, and there are some songs that, you know, like you might listen to on your way to do something bad and it makes you like emboldened to do which is bad, that which is bad. Whereas, you know, there are songs that when you just listen to, you just want to be a better person. And that's what this is getting at, you know, um, like sort of one of the aesthetic virtues is that it should promote like moral uprightness. Um, and then their Christian approach to aesthetics is also interested, um, uh, you know, with is avoiding aesthetic vices. So virtue is praiseworthy, a vice is a deficiency of character. So in aesthetics, like aesthetic vices, so not virtues, vices, aesthetic vices, vices related to art would be things like laziness. Like if you're just, you know, like copying, right? Banality, like a lack of originality, artificiality, right? If you're just like projecting happiness, but not really like, like actually dealing with reality um, or you're not being authentic or you're being utilitarian, um, in other words, like if you're just doing something to appeal to the masses, like those are aesthetic vices versus the aesthetic virtues of truth, excellence, originality, um, honesty, integrity, and intentionality. So uh, hopefully that's helpful for you, especially if you're an artist. Like if you're an artist, you should be aiming for um, beauty and, and asking yourself, am I Am I, am I walking in these, vi these virtues that correspond to the arts? And am I avoiding, avoiding these vices that really are not um, consistent with the message of, uh, of Christianity, of a beautiful God and a world filled with beauty? Humans who reflect God's beauty are capable of reflecting God's beauty. And um, so, um, so now, now if, if art needs to promote beauty, 
And if beauty is about sort of reflecting God's virtue and God's truth through some art medium, then what about a movie like 1917, right? I've mentioned this a lot. I think this is a great movie. Um, it's a movie about World War I, as I've said. It's filled with like ugliness in a lot of ways, trench warfare, death. So like you might be thinking, well, th this must be like ugly. But, but here's a question I would ask, okay? So when you see 1917, does it make war look like something you would want more of or something you'd want less of? Uh, because the truth is that war is like a really tragic uh, reality um, that we should avoid as much as possible given the fact that we live in a fallen world. And I would say that 1917 reflects the ugliness of war, the appropriate ugliness of war. So you should watch the 1917, the, you, you should watch 1917 and you should walk away from the movie saying, um, war is ugly, um, we should avoid it. And in the midst of that which is ugly, the beauty of loyalty and sacrifice shines through. That the, the light of truth shines through the dark times of life. I think those are some of like the, the messages of the 1917. So I would say even though the 1917 deals with that which is uh, really tragic, it deals with tragedy in an, in an honest way. Um, so on the other hand, um, oh, I'm, I'm messed up here. I, I got my slides messed up. But here, here are some movies that I think lie. Okay, so it's just an example. Like there was this movie in the 1970s called um, Same Time Next Year. And it's about this couple that has an affair and they meet every year at the same time to have an affair, same time, same place. And it turns out like this is an amazing thing. It makes their life great. And they really enjoy this adulterous relationship. And like, if you think that is reality in any way, I've got some land in the desert that I would like to sell you because that's not the truth. The truth is infidelity destroys, it breeds distrust. It is no foundation for a long lasting relationship. So like in the 1970s, this is an example of a movie that lies, same time next year. Ask your grandparents about it. They probably watched it. Uh, Ocean's Eleven, maybe this is getting a little closer to like what you might have seen. Ocean's Eleven, again, another movie. I liked it, I thought it was um, in entertaining. But if you would have said, is it good art? I would say no, why? Because I think it glorifies crime. And I think a lot of movies fall into the category of glorifying crime. And I don't think that good art lies. And so if the art you're watching is telling you crime pays, I think that's, um, just really not an honest uh, project, uh, a presentation of the effect that crime has. I don't think crime is a foundation for friendship. I don't think crime is a foundation for thriving, happiness, any of the things that this movie says will be yours if you just have the right group of people and like the perfect crime. Doesn't exist, uh, just not reality. So um, the third movie would be Fight Club. You've probably seen Fight Club. Fight Club is about kind of like, you know, wouldn't it be great if guys got together and like got in touch with their sort of animal selves and just like beat the crap out of each other? Wouldn't that be awesome? Well, no, that wouldn't be awesome. I, I, don't, I don't know. I can't think of a situation I would like less than getting together with a group of guys and beating each other up. Like how you think that builds camaraderie, it, I just think is um, not reality. You know, just physically, you don't just get pummeled in the head and just get up like everything's okay. Um, and so, you know, Fight Club has a lot of messages. It's anti-capitalist. I don't think that's true. Uh, it sort of has this idea that, you know, like man, man like real raw manhood is just like, um, just raw, physicality, which I don't think is like any true metric of manhood. So for lots of reasons, I don't think that these movies tell you the truth. You might disagree, but here's the question you got to ask yourself is, does art tell me the truth or does it lie? So going back to where I was, I apologize. Is it art? So you got to ask yourself, like just because, just because um, like the art world says something is art, just because something wins awards, doesn't mean it's art. It's not art if it's not beautiful, and it's not beautiful if it doesn't tell you the truth. So those are some ways that you can discern, you know, beauty from that which is beautiful from that which is ugly. All right, <clears throat> now, here is an example 
of um, like art gone bad, just bad. So Marco Avaristi uh, is a, I believe he's a Dutch artist actually. I, I, maybe he's Spanish, but, um, but I think he actually does his art out of um, Northern Europe. I think he's Dutch. Um, so, but at any rate, um, he had a, 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 an art installation called Helena. And I don't know if you can see this real well, but this is a series of blenders and in the blenders are goldfish. Yuck. Yeah, exactly. So he set these blenders up with a button and, you know, the art exhibit was you would come in and press the button and you would watch these fish just get pulverized. Now, his argument was, look, fish die every day. We all probably love sushi. Who doesn't love sushi? And you probably don't look at the sushi and just grieve for the fish. Um, now you're eating a fish, so maybe like your justification is the fish gave their life for my life or something like that. But nonetheless, you know, this, this gentleman, uh, Marco Avaristi, argued, look, the, the fish didn't really feel any pain and their lives were given for something greater, just like food, you know, eating is greater and art is greater. And he said, look, this is art. Um, and so, you know, you have to think through a definition of art that can weed out like Something as beautiful as the Mona Lisa, or Starry Nights, um, or something as thought-provoking as Guernica, um, uh, from something as kind of foul as just a bunch of fish getting chewed up in a blender. I mean, you don't have a PhD. You don't have to have a PhD in art to just kind of go, "Yuck, that's that's kind of ugly." Um, so, so how do we define art? How do we define beauty? And like, look, here's the challenge. Okay. The challenge is, is what we want to say oftentimes is, well, beauty is just totally subjective. But, but, but there's sort of a fork, fork in the road here. And what I'm arguing for is an objective concept of beauty, not a subjective concept of beauty. And if something's objective, it has to be grounded in something. And I think that beauty is grounded in God, as I've already stated. Um, if you reject God as the foundation of beauty, you're kind of left without a foundation, as we saw with morality. You're just kind of lost. And in the case of art, you know, you, you're kind of in trouble because while we want to say, you know, beauty is kind of like this, like flexible term, the reality is we use it to pick out things in reality that are praiseworthy or um, uh, um, uh, things that should, uh, sh should attract our attention, things that are excellent, things that are noble. So beauty sort of in the world of objects, beauty picks out those things that are higher, that are praiseworthy, that are noble, that are uh, sort of aspirational. And so, you know, um, like our world's obsession with physical beauty has sort of plunged us into this subjectivity about beauty. But the reality is beauty as a concept is not subjective, it's objective. It stems from God. And human beauty really needs to be focused on the virtues, the characters that reflect 